In this section, we'll look at the foot. As usual, we'll start with the bones. After that, we'll look at the joints and ligaments, the muscles, the blood vessels and nerves, and lastly, the skin. We saw most of the bones of the foot in the last section. Here, we'll briefly review the tarsal bones, then we'll look at the metatarsals and the bones of the toes. Here's the calcaneus, the talus, the navicular, the cuneiforms, first, second, and third, and the cuboid. Let's see the same bones again from beneath, the calcaneus, the cuboid, the cuneiforms, the navicular, and the talus again. Now we'll look at the metatarsals. Like the toes, the metatarsals are numbered 1 through 5. The first metatarsal is more massive than the others. The second metatarsal is the longest. On the base of the fifth metatarsal, there's a prominent tubercle. The metatarsals are slightly curved from end to end. The heads of the metatarsals lie in one flat plane but their bases form an arch from side to side. As do the tarsal bones that they articulate with. These are the three cuneiform bones and the cuboid. These are the tarsometatarsal joints. There's very little movement at any of them. The bones of the foot are arched in two planes from side to side as we've just seen, and also from end to end. We'll be looking at the structures that support the arches of the foot in a minute. To finish with the dry bones, let's look at the toes. The big toe has only two phalanges, a proximal and a distal. The other four toes have three phalanges, proximal, middle and distal. These are the metatarsophalangeal joints, or MP joints for short. The joints between the phalanges are the interphalangeal joints. The bones of the toes are quite similar to the corresponding bones of the fingers, which are shown in Volume 1 of this atlas. Now that we've seen the dry bones of the foot, let's see what they're like in the living body. We're already familiar with the ligaments around the ankle, what we'll look at now are the ligamentous structures that hold this apparently delicate arch of bones together and enable it to support the whole weight of the body. Here's the foot with all the soft tissues removed and all the joints and ligaments intact. On the dorsum of the foot there's an almost continuous layer of ligaments connecting the tarsal bones both to each other and to the metatarsals and connecting the heads of the metatarsals together. The ligaments on the dorsum of the foot are strong ligaments, but the truly impressive ligaments, the ones which support the longitudinal arch, are on the underside of the foot. First, here's the short plantar ligament. It goes from here on the calcaneus to here on the cuboid bone. Just in front of the short plantar ligament is the groove for the perineus longus tendon. Lying directly beneath the short plantar ligament is the long plantar ligament. The long plantar ligament also starts here on the calcaneus and goes all the way to the bases of the third, fourth and fifth metatarsals. The long plantar ligament bridges over, or rather under, the perineus longus tendon. Here's the tendon going to its insertion on the base of the first metatarsal there's another, even more impressive structure that supports the arch of the foot, the plantar aponeurosis. The plantar aponeurosis is a massive sheet of tendon-like tissue that runs the whole length of the foot. It starts here on the calcaneus. It fans out as it runs forward. As it approaches the MP joints, 
The plantar aponeurosis splits into five divisions. Most of the fibers of each division pass into two slips, which pass forward and upward toward the MP joint. We'll see where they go in a minute. To understand where the slips of the plantar aponeurosis insert, we first need to look at the MP joints and at some structures nearby, the flexor tendon sheaths, the plantar ligaments of the MP joints, and the ligament that connects the metatarsal heads, the deep transverse metatarsal ligament. Here's the deep transverse metatarsal ligament. It goes all the way from the first MP joint to the fifth. The flexor tendon sheaths, which we'll see in a minute, are attached along these lines. To take a look at a typical MP joint and the structures around it, we'll look at a toe and its metatarsal in isolation. Here's the MP joint with its capsule intact. Here it is with the loose parts of the capsule removed. There's a broad collateral ligament on each side. The MP joint can't flex much beyond a straight position, but it can extend all the way to here. Here's an MP joint divided longitudinally. The joint capsule is thin on the dorsal aspect and massively thickened on the plantar aspect. This thick part of the capsule is the plantar ligament of the MP joint. It's fixed to the proximal phalanx here. So when the joint is extended, the plantar ligament is pulled forward. Here's the plantar ligament in the intact joint. The tendon sheath is attached to the plantar ligament here and here. Here's a short piece of the tendon sheath intact. It runs the whole length of the toe, as we'll see later. Also attached to the plantar ligament of the MP joint is the deep transverse metatarsal ligament. Here's its attachment on one side. Here it is on the other side. Here's the MP joint of the big toe, the first MP joint. It's much larger than the other MP joints, and it has two additional structures, a pair of sesamoid bones, which are enclosed within the plantar ligament. One of them's here, the other one's here. Now that we've looked at the MP joints and the structures around them, Let's go back to the plantar aponeurosis and see how it's inserted. As we've seen, each division of the aponeurosis gives rise to two slips. These lie on each side of the flexor tendons. The two slips are inserted here and here on each side of the plantar ligament of the MP joint. Since the plantar aponeurosis is inserted into a set of movable structures, the plantar ligaments of the MP joints, its tightness varies depending on the position of these joints. When the MP joints are straight, the plantar aponeurosis is slack. But when they're extended, it becomes much tighter. The plantar aponeurosis acts as a continuation of the Achilles tendon. When it's tight, as it is when the MP joints are extended, it enables the pull of the calcaneal tendon to be transmitted directly to the metatarsal heads. That's why the arch of the foot remains an arch, even at the moments when we place the heaviest loads on it. The plantar aponeurosis is the central part and much the strongest part of a layer of fascia, the plantar fascia, which covers the entire sole of the foot. We'll see the whole of the plantar fascia when we've looked at the muscles of the foot, which we're going to do shortly. Let's now review what we've seen of the bones, joints, and ligaments of the foot. Here are the metacarpals, the proximal phalanges, the middle phalanges, and distal phalanges, the tarsometatarsal joints, the metatarsophalangeal joints, 
and the interphalangeal joints. Here are the short plantar ligament, the long plantar ligament, and the plantar aponeurosis. Here's the deep transverse metatarsal ligament, the flexor tendon sheaths, and the plantar ligament of the MP joint. Now we'll look at the muscles which produce movement of the toes. We'll look at the extensor muscles first. There are two long extensors to the toes and two short ones. The long extensors are two of the four muscles that we left out of the picture in the last section. Here's extensor hallucis longus. Extensor hallucis longus arises from the interosseous membrane and from the adjoining fibula. Lying on top of extensor hallucis longus is extensor digitorum longus. Extensor digitorum longus has a long line of origin here on the fibula. This gap is for the common perineal nerve. To see all the muscles of the anterior compartment together, we'll add tibialis anterior to the picture. Here it is. We saw tibialis anterior in the last section. It almost covers up extensor hallucis longus. We'll also add perineus tertius which arises in continuity with extensor digitorum longus. Here are the tendons of all these muscles passing under the extensor retinaculum. Perineus tertius, extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, and tibialis anterior. The tendon of extensor hallucis longus inserts partly into the extensor expansion of the first MP joint, and partly here, into the base of the distal phalanx of the big toe. The tendons of extensor digitorum longus insert, by way of the extensor expansion of each toe, into the bases of the middle and distal phalanges. The extensor expansion of the toe is quite similar to the extensor expansion of the finger, which is described in some detail in Volume 1 of this atlas. Here's the action of extensor hallucis longus. It extends both joints of the big toe. Here's the action of extensor digitorum longus. Its action is mainly at the MP joint. The two long toe extensor muscles have another important action besides extending the toes. They're also quite powerful dorsiflexors of the ankle. Now let's add the short extensors to the picture. Here they are. They lie beneath the tendons of the long extensors. Extensor hallucis brevis goes to the big toe. The four slips of extensor digitorum brevis go to the four short toes. The short toe extensors arise here on the front of the calcaneus. The tendons of the short extensors join the corresponding long extensor tendons. The action of the short extensors is the same as that of the long extensors, except that they don't dorsiflex the ankle. Now we'll look at the muscles which flex the toes. First, we'll look at the two long flexors, flexor hallucis longus and flexor digitorum longus. They're the other two muscles that we left out of the picture in the last section. Here's flexor hallucis longus. Flexor hallucis longus arises from here on the back of the fibula. Medial to flexor hallucis longus is flexor digitorum longus. Flexor digitorum longus arises from here on the back of the tibia. This gap is for the tendon of tibialis posterior. The relative position of these two muscles, this one for the big toe, this one, for the four small toes, is the reverse of what you'd expect when you look at where they're going. 
As we'll see, their two tendons cross over just below the ankle. To complete our picture of the deep posterior leg muscles, we'll add the third one, tibialis posterior, to the picture. We saw it in the last section. It's the most deeply placed of the three muscles. Tibialis posterior crosses beneath flexor digitorum longus and emerges in front of it, just above the ankle. At the ankle, here are flexor hallucis longus, flexor digitorum longus, and tibialis posterior, each passing beneath the flexor retinaculum in its own fibrous tunnel. Emerging below the retinaculum, the two long toe flexors cross over, flexor hallucis longus lying deeper. The tendon of flexor hallucis longus passes forwards and enters the fibrous flexor tendon sheath of the big toe. The two sesamoid bones lie on each side of it, here and here, as it passes beneath the MP joint. Flexor hallucis longus is inserted here on the base of the distal phalanx of the big toe. Flexor digitorum longus divides into four tendons, one for each of the small toes. These pass along the flexor tendon sheaths and insert here on the distal phalanges. Here's the action of flexor hallucis longus. Here's the action of flexor digitorum longus. Now we'll move on to look at the numerous small muscles on the plantar aspect of the foot. The intricacy of these muscles reminds us that our human foot has evolved from feet that had many other functions besides that of being walked on. Since some of the smaller muscles are now almost vestigial structures, we'll be looking at them quite briefly. We'll look at the small plantar muscles in four groups. First, the interosseous muscles, then the short muscles that occupy the middle of the foot, then the short muscles for the big toe, and lastly, the ones for the fifth toe. Here are the interosseous muscles. There are seven of them. Two for each of the three middle toes, and one for the fifth toe. The interosseous muscles arise from the shafts of the metatarsals and insert into the bases of the proximal phalanges. The action of the interosseous muscles is to flex the toes at the MP joints. Now we'll look at the middle group of muscles. These are all closely associated with the tendon of flexor digitorum longus. The middle group consists of the tiny lumbrical muscles, flexor accessorius, and superficial to them, flexor digitorum brevis, which we'll see again in a moment. The four lumbricals are just like the lumbricals in the hand. We won't look at them in detail. Flexor accessorius, also called quadratus planti, arises by two heads from here and here on the calcaneus. Flexor accessorius inserts here into the deep aspect of the tendon of flexor digitorum longus. Flexor accessorius aids in flexing the toes. Now we'll add flexor digitorum brevis to the picture. Here it is again. Flexor digitorum brevis arises from here on the calcaneus. Flexor digitorum brevis divides to form four tendons. Each of these enters one of the tendon sheaths, along with a tendon of flexor digitorum longus. Inside the tendon sheath, which we'll remove, the brevis tendon splits into two halves, which encircle the longus tendon. Flexor digitorum brevis inserts here on the bases of the middle phalanges. Flexor digitorum brevis assists in producing flexion at the PIP and MP joints. Lying superficial to flexor digitorum brevis is the plantar aponeurosis, which we've looked at already. Now we'll look at the muscles for the big toe. To build up a picture of them, 
we'll first take the middle group of muscles out of the picture so that we're again looking at just the interossei. The muscles for the big toe are flexor hallucis brevis, adductor hallucis, and abductor hallucis. We'll look at them in that order. Flexor hallucis brevis has two almost distinct parts, which arise here from the cuboid and third cuneiform bones. Flexor hallucis brevis gives rise to two tendons of insertion, which attach first to the medial and lateral sesamoid bones, then to the base of the proximal phalanx of the big toe. The tendon of flexor hallucis longus, which we'll add to the picture for a moment, runs between the two halves of flexor hallucis brevis. Here's adductor hallucis. It arises by two heads, an oblique head and a transverse head. The oblique head arises from the bases of the middle three metatarsals. The transverse head arises from the deep transverse metatarsal ligament. These two heads converge and merge with the medial head of flexor hallucis brevis, sharing its insertion on the medial sesamoid bone and on the base of the proximal phalanx. Medial to flexor hallucis brevis is abductor hallucis. Abductor hallucis is the most medial of all the foot muscles. It arises here on the medial side of the calcaneus. The tendon of abductor hallucis merges with the medial part of flexor hallucis brevis and inserts with it here on the medial sesamoid bone and on the base of the proximal phalanx. The main action of all three of the short muscles of the big toe is to produce flexion at the MP joint. In addition, adductor and abductor hallucis brevis can produce adduction and abduction of the big toe. Lastly, there are two short muscles for the fifth toe, a short flexor and an abductor. Here's the flexor, flexor digiti minimi brevis. It's an outlying interosseous muscle that's been given a long name. Here's the abductor, abductor digiti minimi. It arises all the way back here on the calcaneus. It's inserted here on the proximal phalanx of the fifth toe. Now that we've seen the muscles for the big toe and the fifth toe, we need to see how all these short muscles fit together. To do that, we'll put the long flexor tendons and then the central group of muscles back into the picture. First, we'll add flexor hallucis longus to the picture. Flexor hallucis longus lies deep to abductor hallucis as it enters the foot. Here's flexor digitorum longus, entering the foot along with flexor hallucis longus. The tendons of flexor digitorum longus cover up adductor hallucis. Here are the lumbricals, flexor accessorius, and last of all, flexor digitorum brevis. Now that we've seen all the muscles of the foot, let's get a complete picture of the layer of deep fascia that encloses them all, the plantar fascia. The central thickened part of the plantar fascia is the plantar aponeurosis, which we've seen already. The medial and lateral parts of the plantar fascia extend on each side of the plantar aponeurosis. On the medial side, the plantar fascia covers abductor hallucis. On the lateral side, it covers abductor digiti minimi. Here on the lateral side, there's a marked thickening of the plantar fascia called the lateral cord of the plantar aponeurosis, which goes from here on the calcaneus to here on the base of the fifth metatarsal. The lateral cord of the plantar aponeurosis helps to support the longitudinal arch of the foot on the lateral side. We've seen all the muscles of the foot. Let's review them before we move on 
to look at the blood vessels and nerves of the foot. Here's extensor digitorum longus, extensor halicis longus, extensor digitorum brevis, and halicis brevis. On the back, here's flexor digitorum longus and flexor halicis longus. Here are the interosseous muscles, the lumbricals, flexor accessorius, and flexor digitorum brevis. Here's abductor halicis, flexor halicis brevis, and adductor halicis. And lastly, here are abductor digiti minimi, and flexor digiti minimi brevis. Now we'll look at the blood vessels and nerves of the foot, starting with the veins. The superficial veins of the lateral aspect of the foot join together to form the short saphenous vein. The ones on the medial aspect of the foot join together to form the long saphenous vein. In addition, at a deeper level, the arteries, which we'll be looking at next, are closely accompanied by concomitant veins like these. From here on, we'll remove all the concomitant veins to simplify the picture. We last saw the anterior and posterior tibial arteries entering the foot beneath the extensor retinaculum and flexor retinaculum, respectively. Here's the anterior tibial artery at the ankle, passing beneath the extensor retinaculum. We'll remove the retinaculum. As it passes in front of the ankle, the anterior tibial artery crosses beneath extensor halicis longus, emerging lateral to it. It gives off branches to the tarsal region, then continues on to the dorsum of the foot. Beyond this point, it's known as the dorsalis pedis artery. The dorsalis pedis artery passes beneath the extensor halicis brevis muscle, gives off this first dorsal metatarsal artery, and ends by diving through the first interosseous muscle to join up with the lateral plantar artery, which we'll see in a minute. Now we'll look at the posterior tibial artery, or rather at its two terminal branches, the medial plantar and lateral plantar arteries. Here's where we saw them last, emerging from under the flexor retinaculum, the lower part of which has been removed in this dissection. Also removed are the abductor halicis muscle, here, and the plantar aponeurosis, here. This is the distal end of the posterior tibial artery. This is the lateral plantar artery. This is the medial plantar artery. The medial plantar artery is usually the smaller of the two. It crosses over the tendons of the two long toe flexors and runs along the medial side of the foot. Its branches supply the adjoining muscles and the underside of the big toe. Now we'll look at the lateral plantar artery. It passes deep to flexor digitorum brevis, which we'll remove. After giving off this calcaneal branch, the lateral plantar artery passes downwards and then laterally across flexor accessorius. When it reaches the base of the fifth metatarsal, which is here, it curves around and passes deep to flexor digitorum longus and the interosseous muscles to join up with the dorsalis pedis artery. Now we'll look at the nerves of the foot. We'll follow the nerves that we saw in the last section, the superficial and deep perineal nerves and the medial and lateral plantar nerves. There are two more nerves that we'll also look at for completeness, the sural nerve and the saphenous nerve. We'll start with the two perineal nerves. The superficial perineal nerve runs down in front of the lateral side of the ankle and breaks up into several branches. These fan out to provide sensation to this large area on the dorsum of the foot. 
the deep perineal nerve enters the foot along with the dorsalis pedis artery. It gives off a motor branch which supplies the short toe extensor muscles. It continues distally as a sensory nerve which supplies this small area between the big and second toes. Next we'll look at the medial and lateral plantar nerves. They follow the same course as the medial and lateral plantar arteries. Here's the medial plantar nerve. It gives off motor branches which supply flexor digitorum brevis, abductor hallucis, and flexor hallucis brevis. To follow the medial plantar nerve, we'll go round to the underside of the foot. Distally, the medial plantar nerve breaks up into common plantar digital nerves. These pass between the metatarsal heads, where each in turn divides into two plantar digital nerves. The medial plantar nerve supplies the underside of the big toe, the second, third, and half of the fourth toes. It also supplies this medial area on the sole of the foot. Now we'll look at the lateral plantar nerve. It runs just in front of the lateral plantar artery. To follow it, we'll again go round to the underside of the foot. Flexor digitorum brevis has been removed. The lateral plantar nerve gives motor branches to flexor accessorius and abductor digiti minimi. It then divides into a deep branch which supplies all the interossei and adductor halysis and a superficial branch which supplies flexor digiti minimi brevis and provides sensation to the lateral part of the sole, the fifth toe and half of the fourth toe. To complete our picture of the nerves that provide sensation to the foot, we'll add two nerves that were passed over in the last section, the sural nerve and the saphenous nerve. The sural nerve, which runs down the back of the leg, is formed by two nerves which join together. One is the medial sural cutaneous branch of the tibial nerve, the other is the sural communicating branch of the common perineal nerve. The sural nerve runs down the lateral side of the ankle behind the lateral malleolus. The sural nerve supplies sensation to a variable area along the lateral side of the foot. The saphenous nerve, a branch of the femoral nerve, emerges at the knee from beneath the insertion of the sartorius muscle. It runs down the medial side of the leg and supplies a variable area on the medial side of the foot and ankle. Last of all, the heel area is supplied by calcaneal branches of the tibial nerve, which are given off beneath the flexor retinaculum. Now, let's review what we've seen of the blood vessels and nerves of the foot. Here's the start of the long saphenous vein and the short saphenous vein. Here's the dorsalis pedis artery, the lateral plantar artery, and the medial plantar artery. Here's the sural nerve, the superficial perineal nerve, and the saphenous nerve. The deep perineal nerve, the medial plantar nerve, and the lateral plantar nerve. Last of all, we'll look at the skin of the foot. On the dorsum of the foot, the skin is thin and mobile. On the plantar aspect, the skin is markedly thickened, especially in the weight-bearing areas. There's a generous padding of fat on the sole of the foot, especially on the heel. The skin on the sole of the foot is tethered to the deeper tissues by numerous firm strands of fibrous tissue. These strands arise from the underlying bone and the plantar aponeurosis and pass through the fat 
into the subdermis, keeping the weight-bearing skin firmly in place. That brings us to the end of Volume 2 of this atlas. In Volume 3, we'll look at the musculoskeletal system of the trunk, from the neck to the pelvis.